Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Observing protocol this evening, Acting Prime Minister and Minister responsible for the Ministry of Justice, the Honorable Raphael Bosman. Keynote speaker, Attorney at Law, Ms. Zelena Barry. Secretary General of the Ministry of General Affairs, Mr. Hensley Plantain. Secretary General of the Ministry of Finance, Mr. Arnold Peels. Secretary General of the Council of Advice, I notice in the audience with us this evening, Mr. Ajamu Bailey. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome. I'm Cedric Peterson on behalf of the Department of Communication and the faculty and staff of the University of St. Martin. I bid you a warm welcome to the fourth installment of the lecture series entitled The Law Matters to You. Tonight's subject is dealing, of course, with the introduction in criminal law. To set the pace or set the tone for tonight's address, I'd like to invite our first speaker to address you, representing the government, and of course, on behalf of the Minister of Prime Minister and Minister of General Affairs, I invite the Minister Responsible for Justice, the Honorable Raphael Bozeman, to address you. Please welcome him. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Protocol already have been served. I still would like to acknowledge uh, Mr. Rodney Richardson, head of the DCOM, and um, officials of the University of St. Martin. It is with pride and great pleasure that I bid you all a warm welcome to this lecture on criminal law. I thank you sincerely for your presence. I want to commend DCOM in collaboration with the University of St. Martin for organizing this and other informative sessions on topics that are vital to the general public. But I am particularly happy about tonight's session on law, criminal law to be exact. As you know, as Minister of Justice, this falls directly under my portfolio. So I thank every one of you present this evening for taking time out of your busy schedules to attend this session. It is not often that the type of information that you will be presented with um, this evening is passed on free of charge. So at no cost at all to you. Under normal circumstances, one would have to pay uh, a lot of dollars per hour to a lawyer for such information. But tonight, thanks to DCOM and the USM, you have the unique opportunity to get as much information as you possibly can from a very qualified and capable source. The keynote speaker for this evening is well versed in criminal law and is a perfect source for information in this regard. She will be introduced to you at the later stage of the evening. I don't want to take the job of the MC. The laws of any country can be very intriguing and somewhat complicated to the average man. Our country has many laws, and uh, they are so complicated that one is expected to complete a university, get a university degree, to basically have a good understanding of these laws. So you can imagine the challenge for the average man as far as that is concerned. But that is why we have lawyers, like tonight's keynote speaker. I have to stress that it is uh, in everybody's interest to be aware of their rights and their responsibilities in the community. Everybody is expected to conduct themselves according to the laws. But how can you adhere to the laws if you are not familiar with the laws? But having said that, and um, it, it, there's another catch to that, is because ignorance is no excuse for non-compliance with the law. In plain English, not knowing the law is no excuse to break the law. So I therefore implore you to get as much information as you can out of tonight's lecture, ask questions, seek information, challenge the presenter, but make sure you leave here a better informed person. Having said that, I welcome again all of you here this evening and hope that this will be a very informative session. Thank you. Good evening to all. Protocol being established. 
I'd like to welcome you all on behalf of our president, Dr. Francio Guadalupe, and other members of the management team to the University of St. Martin and to this lecture series. USM is more than a center of teaching and learning and research. It is also a platform for debate, discussion, dissemination of information, and a place of exchange of ideas, be they cultural, economic, or jurisprudence. USM is happy to collaborate with the Department of Communication to organize this law lecture series entitled, The Law Matters to You, and it does. This lecture series aims at informing and educating the general public of St. Martin about the different areas of law. There's a long list of topics to be discussed in future series, such as immigration law, family law, rent committee laws, corporate laws, just to name a few. But tonight's topic is criminal law. This lecture series presents a unique opportunity to bring the law closer to us. No longer can we consider and say that the law is complicated, it's distant, it's obscured. We have the law and we can ask and questions will be asked and answered tonight. So as we listen and participate, we should be able to understand the issues we face in our communities and in St. Martin as it pertains to criminal law. Let's enjoy the series tonight. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, our keynote speaker graduated cum laude from Barry University in Miami, Florida in the year 2000 with a bachelor's degree in sociology with a, with a minor in political science. She graduated from the University of Amsterdam in the Netherlands in 2004 with the title of master's in the degree of Dutch law. In 2005, she was sworn in as an attorney here on St. Martin and has since been practicing law on her own, actually, her own practice for 12 years and specializes in civil and criminal law. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome tonight's uh, keynote speaker at the fourth installment of The Law Matters to You, Attorney at Law, Ms. Zelina Barry. All right, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out. Um, after a long, hard day of work, it must be challenging to sit here and try to get engaged. So I'll try to keep us engaged. Already, um, protocol has been established. So thank you for the warm introduction, Mr. Peterson and Mr. Mason, and of course, the Minister of Justice. Now, the idea of criminal law, I want to make it clear, I was asked to speak approximately 20 minutes, but I do not want to insult the law and make it seem as if we can cover such a vast topic in 15 minutes. This thing is almost like an octopus, and each tentacle has another tentacle. So this is really intended to be introduction. And so, of course, I'll be welcome to come back at any time and give a more specific one on a specific topic. So tonight, we have to start with some basic principles. Everybody, everyone has a right to freedom. They have a right to privacy. There are many other fundamental rights that people enjoy. And those freedoms and rights have to be respected by everyone, and that includes the government. At the same time, the government has an obligation to prosecute people who break the law. And that can cause a conflict between your right to, for example, freedom, to not be arrested, detained, and their right to prosecute and deny you that freedom in the interest of the case or the alleged crime. And the purpose of criminal law is to have rules that guide the balance between sometimes very conflicting departure points. And when we say criminal law, it's important to understand because a lot of people with our influence from America, they get the impression that criminal law is law and order, as for you, criminal intent. And while I love as for you, that is not our system of law here in St. Martin. And there are some fundamental differences between the law in America and here. And without making it a lecture on differences, I want to highlight a couple but very important differences between the two systems. In America, for example, in a criminal court case, you're gonna have the jury system, where the theory is you're gonna have a group of 12 people, your peers, that's gonna determine your guilt or your innocence. And there's been much literature on the topic of 
well, are the 12 people sitting on a jury really your peers? If you are accused, for example, of tax evasion, and there are complicated laws, principles, maybe even arithmetic involved, and you have people on a jury that maybe come from the construction, they're primary school teachers, and while all are very intelligent and capable, the material can be so complex that it will go, let's just put it lightly, over the heads of these people. But those people will be the people tasked with deciding if you're innocent or you're guilty. Other issues you have with a, a jury system versus our system, which I'll get to just now, is that a jury has been known to fall prey to sensation, drama, racism, sexism, anything else. We even have another show on American TV called Lie to Me, where you see people are paid to help select these jury members to sway the vote in their favor or what they think their client would need. We don't have that. We have one judge that's gonna make that decision, and that decision he will base on, or she will base on the law and the evidence is supported by the public prosecutor office in the case. And when we talk about judges, even there there's a small difference between here and America, small being big, in that except for example the Supreme Court who, who those people are appointed, the lower judges can be elected by people. And we've seen what happens on St. Martin when there's an election for our government. So can you imagine that the people that have to decide your innocence and your guilt are gonna be elected by the, the populace. And you know, there's enough literature showing that just before an election, somebody breaking a law may stand to have a higher punishment than somebody after the election has taken place because they want to vote. Um, come vote for me, I'm gonna get on hard on crime. That is a, a risk you take when the judges are not appointed. In St. Martin, our judges are appointed for life. So the minute you're a judge, you're appointed until you die and hopefully you do, then you don't have the influences of politics, you don't have the influences of a jury, it's just basically the judge is gonna present the case. When we're talking about sentencing, there's also a difference there. In sentencing in America, for example, you hear some sentences that it almost seems to defy logic. You know, we out of the days of Moses and Methuselah and Moses, and uh, you know, Noah, but you hear people getting 150 years, you hear people getting 286 years to serve concurrently. Most people ain't cracking 90 these days. So after 65, you know, it's like, well, even if you live, you know where you're gonna be. And, <laughs> and so you have the situation when they say life is the possibility of parole and not parole. We don't have that here in St. Martin. When our laws, and I'll give you an example to show how absurd the numbers can become. There's an example of a gentleman, his name was Mr. Charles Scott Robinson. He got sentenced to 30,000 years in jail. Now, I think the, day, the days of the dinosaurs are behind us, but he got 5,000 years for six different counts and it was pertaining to a child rape case. And I know there's people, of course, saying we should get some of those laws here because some of these rapists need to get punished. But I'll get to that just now. In St. Martin, we don't have those type of very elaborate sentences. Our sentences are basically, uh, if you get a temporary punishment, which is in the sense of there's a defined amount of time, the minimum being one day, and the maximum being life. Now, life in St. Martin is life. The only time you're coming out is when the hearse or the coroner take you out. So if you get condemned at 45, and you only live to 46, well, that's your life. If you get condemned at 45, and you happen to be one of those who could live 30,000 years, then you will be in there for 30,000 years, which I don't think is gonna be the case. There are, of course, exceptions. After a significant chunk of that being served, you can ask for a pardon, but there are specific rules for how that would go. But one of the things I always hear is that our laws are not stri stri uh, strict enough. We need stricter laws. These people get no way with anything. I see a lady shaking her head in the audience. But, oh, actually, that's a family member. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, our laws are very strict here on St. Martin. We do have intense years. For example, something like falsifying stamps can be punished with maximum six years. You wouldn't imagine that, but that exists. That's an actual law. Kidnapping, you can get a maximum of 15 years. Something like not paying your child support or alimony, I'm watching the head of the court of guardianship, you're like, mm-hmm. That can leave you with two months max or six months maximum in jail. Something like not intentionally not outing a fire or 
mashing up the fire extinguisher, you can get a max of six years. So the laws exist, the punishments are there, but I think our Minister of Justice would like to come back on another day and explain some of the issues we have with maybe executing some of those excessive laws. But to get to it, criminal law, you have to understand a couple of fundamental departure points or terminologies. And the first and most important one in Dutch is the legaliteitsbeginsel. And when we say that, it basically means if it's not a law written somewhere indicating that this act is illegal, you cannot arrest me for it. It seems logical, but we have had situations in different parts of the world where people get picked up on suspicion, they get dropped in a hole, and you don't hear from them for 15, 20 years, and you don't know what they're being charged with, you don't know what the accusing parties are claiming, you just know that you haven't seen Tom for about 15 years. If it's not written somewhere that is punishable, you can be arrested for it. And if it's not written in, in terms of the details of what your punishment is going to be, you also are going to get away with that. Those are legalities beginsel. We have another beginsel, a uh, uh, departure point here, a principle in St. Martin, and that's opportunities beginsel. And that one is a source of much contention. And I'll give you an example out of our everyday life just now. But it basically means, and for example, contrast to other countries, if the public prosecutor is aware of a crime that has been committed or somebody has filed a complaint, good evening, welcome, then they have the, a very mar, a huge margin of discretion as to are they going to prosecute that or not. There's, of course, some principles. It has to be something that's not going to jeopardize the general interest of Samaritan, the good of the island. But it is possible that a public prosecutor office has a complaint filed, they have the necessary evidence, they have everything to, for conviction and choose not to prosecute. I think one of the more recent examples we've had and that was widely debated in the media was the Masbangu case where there was alleged vote buying in play. People were charged for supposedly paying to vote for some, an individual. And I remember the judge in first instance saying, but where is the person that they say they were doing all this vote by and far? So if you're gonna go after these people, I wanna see the man who supposedly orchestrated this. And he threw out a case. But the, there was an appeal filed, and the Court of Appeals said, no, don't forget that opportunity is working. So the public prosecutor has a very big margin of, as to what he is going to go after or not. And we, as a judge, as a court system, they are not going to go into the detail about why you went after Tom and why. No, that is pretty much up to the public prosecutor to not go after that. I have another example, also taken out of our daily lives. A couple, maybe a year ago already, there were some young men breaking into a, a residence or a hotel, let's say, where some tourists were staying. The tourists came back a little earlier than expected, caught the young men trying to steal some stuff out. A fight broke out. And I mean, when I say a fight, the, the tourists got their nose broken. It was, it was, blocks was flying, it was terrible. And at one point, one of the, the tourists managed to get the, one of the suspects in a neck hole and they choked them and the young man died. And I was on call a week and it was ironic because while the, the suspect that was accused of stealing or trying to break in or stealing something out of the home, he, the, the tourist that was, would have been a suspect was heard as a suspect, but they were never arrested. They never sat inside our police station. We didn't even do the hearing at the police station for fear of repercussions from the community because the family was getting on pretty, pretty, pretty excited. And at a certain point, the public prosecutor was like, listen, you need to get out of here. And we never heard anything about it again. And I don't want to say it's tourist versus local. I'm just saying those are two examples of where you can say, well, that's something I think you should prosecute. Somebody died. We should prosecute it. But it is a principle that you're not going to get the court to easily challenge into the detail why you didn't go after Tom versus Harry. Another important principle in our criminal justice system is the unskilled presumpcy. And while the, the principle basically means you're presumed to be innocent until you can be proven guilty, a lot of people feel it's the other way around. It's like I'm guilty till I can prove my innocence. But that's not so. And based on that principle of you should not 
be considered to be guilty unless a court of law uh, condemns you as such. You have a right to remain silent. You have a right to a lawyer. That communication with your lawyer is sacred and privileged. If you have a conversation and they tap in your phones, if that conversation ends up with your lawyer, they're not supposed to use it, but supposed to be in the operative term. Criminal law is always going to be a touchy topic because unlike in civil law, where the, they call the judge in civil law um, a suffering judge, not because the lawyers can go on and on and on, which I'm sure that has something to do with it, but it's because the parties determine the boundaries that that case is going to be about. So if I feel I was wrongfully terminated or you're stepping over my property with your line, I go to court, the judge is going to focus his, his attention and his interest on that. We're not going to bring in what a neighbor doing and what somebody else doing. He is really bound by the limits that parties themselves have set. But in a criminal case, that's very different. The, the role of a judge is very active. He's not only there to see if you're innocent or you're guilty, he actually or she wants to know what happened. So they're going to ask you questions, but where were you? And, and where was Tom? And where was Jane? And did you know? And what? It's very active. And so you're not just going to go there, sit down, say, I'm going to say nothing and get acquitted. No, there's a whole procedure that goes on with it. But the most important topic in criminal law that you'll ever hear is that term called the verdachter or the suspect. And it seems logical. Of course, you have to have somebody that you expect is guilty of doing something else. What's the point? But it's not as simple as you think because there was a famous arrest back in the 70s called the Hollander Clearling, or if we are translated loosely, a running black man. And this, yeah, as funny as it seems, but that's exactly what it means. <laughs> Minister Light, I want a lot. But this took place in Amsterdam. This was in the late 70s. It was in an area where there was drug dealing going on, drug usage going on. And if anybody's ever been to Amsterdam or see videos, you know under Dam is a very busy, crazy place. And here are two police officers standing up somewhere, and they see this black man speeding, going on the road, running. And one of them like, wait, that look funny. Where he running, going? And they said, let me go ask him some questions. So they stop him, ask him, what's your name? You know, officers here are going to tell you they do that on a regular. But even that is what you call a duang middle. You just can't do that to every and anybody. They have to be a suspect, and I'll define that just now. And when they was interrogating him, they said he was acting nervous. Of course, if two police officers stopped me and I ran, I'd be nervous too. But for them, that was enough. That was suspicious. And lo and behold, they asked him, if we search you, are we going to find anything? Eventually, the guy was like, well, you find a little packet of heroin in my pocket. And they arrested him, possession of drugs. And that's a case that went all the way to the highest court in the law, Hogerat, in our Dutch kingdom at least. It's our version of the Supreme Court. And in that, the judges threw out the whole arrest and the whole idea of this gentleman being a suspect because they're saying what, what a suspect is, is somebody in Dutch, they say that there was a, I'm saying English then, that there was a reasonable suspicion of guilt based on the evidences present that they committed a crime. And you remember we went back to the first things that it got to be written somewhere that it's illegal what I'm accused of doing. And then there needs to be a reasonable suspicion. And the, the, the final judges said, listen, not because he was running and not because it happened to be a little drug area there, that doesn't make it a reasonable suspicion that he committed a crime. He could have been running for a bus. He could have been going for the tram. He could have been late. He could be getting in shape. I don't know. But <laughs> that was not enough to consider it a suspect. And that's a very important um, term because a lot of times people say, but these lawyers, they, they, always, they always trying to get out of these criminals. Yeah, but if we have to understand that the public prosecutor's office, this under the government, is tasked with prosecuting crimes or alleged crimes, and that basis is you break the law so the prosecutor coming for you, we got to make sure the prosecutors are upholding the same rules that they say they're going to prosecute. So you can't have you breaking the law to uphold the law. You know, evil means evil ends, we know the story. So on that grounds, you have something what ended up happening, what they call the fruit of the poisonous tree. So you arrested me. The arrest turned out not to be legal. Just to continue that example, not that same one, I'll elaborate a little bit on a fictitious circumstance. So let's say they did arrest the guy, and then that thing, he sit on there and he confessed. I ain't just got marijuana, weed, uh, heroin on me. I got three dead bodies in the backyard. Um, that time when they had robbed the bank, it was me. And the whole confession take, he was like, this is really the easiest case in history. Confession, slam dunk. 
a judge is going to throw it out because they're going to say, listen, when you arrested him, he wasn't a suspect. And so everything that came after that, you have to see like a chain with the different links. Everything that came after that illegal arrest is going to follow too. And then, of course, the public is outraged. But the man say he do it. Does it matter that he wasn't a suspect? Yes. If we're going to live in a democracy and we're going to be saying that you're innocent until you're proven guilty, you can't hold me to a confession that actually was derived illegally. And when we're talking about a suspect and we're talking about Duang Medela, which is, a, I don't know how to translate it loosely, but it basically means the authority of the the police or the public prosecutor's office to violate your, your civil liberties. It's not just your right to freedom. When I say right to freedom, anybody here decide this woman crazy, I'm picking up and I'm leaving, nobody can stop you. I mean, I'm actually not to leave, but I can't stop you. But if one of these officers here notice that you committed a crime, they're gonna take you against your will and put you in a cell somewhere, and you can't say, well, I have fundamental rights and freedoms, I would like to go home now. And be like, that's nice, you lie and come tomorrow, you're gonna stay right here. But it's not just arresting. I mean, something like going to your home, searching your house, something like tapping your phones, which I wonder if that happened a little more than we know. Something like checking your bank accounts. I mean, there's all of those things that you have a right to privacy and expect that nobody gonna be in your business. You can lose those rights if it falls under you being a suspect and a criminal investigation being going on. A very important person in the criminal um, justice system or the procedures is who we call the rector commissaris, or the judge of instruction loosely translated. That is also a judge, and it's sometimes difficult for people to understand because this is the judge that is less gonna say, gonna make sure that the prosecutor playing by the rules. Because again, you're innocent until you're proven guilty, and while you've been arrested, after X amount of days, well, maximum three days to be specific, you have to be brought in front of the judge of instruction if the police choose to keep you. And the reason for that is, we want to make sure that if you are arrested and the prosecutor say, we, we feel that she's a suspect, we suspect, yeah, big, big stuff. You can't keep me indefinitely on this suspect. What exactly are you talking about? Was there a complaint filed? What evidence do you have? And if the judge finds after those three days that there's insufficient reason to consider you to have been a suspect, they're going to release you. And that is a kind of check and balance that is built into our law to make sure that in the overzealousness of the prosecutor's office to bring a culprit to justice, that they don't overstep the boundaries themselves. And it's not nice for the suspects because they got jobs, they got families, they got lives, but you can be confronted with a situation where you can spend over 100 days in pretrial detention before you even go to court. So this is all based on a suspicion. And there's a lot of technicalities to it, but traditionally, we need to focus on a couple things. It need to be a crime that there's four years or more attached to it. So if you did do something, and it's, it needs to be a crime. And there's a, there's a distinction you need to make between a, 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 a misdrive and an overtrading. Now, how to translate that loosely, let's just say there's a crime and an offense. So a crime, you kill somebody. That's, that's kind of easy. A offense, maybe you run a red light. There's no four years attached to something like that, unless, of course, somebody go get killed in the process, then you have complications. So you won't be able to hold somebody behind bars for, for pretrial detention because the four years thing is not there. And when you're in there now, you say, well, I want to go home, I have a job. Yeah, but sometimes your interest to go home and your desire to be with your family or go to work is not going to outweigh the prosecutor's interest to find not only you, maybe other suspects that was in this crime with you, and so they're afraid that if they release you, you might go home and tell them, bye, they find me, don't go in the backyard. I didn't tell them about that one. You know. So to keep the case pending and that nobody don't tell the other one, they tend to keep them in there and keep them locked up. But if the, if the prosecutor's office wants to tap your phones, let me make that clear, they just can't start tapping people's phones. I mean, I'm not sure, but they're not supposed to be just tapping people's phones. <laughs> if they do want to tap your phone, y'all shouldn't have sat in the front. That was <laughs> if they do want to tap your phones, the judge of instruction, they're going to have to request them. We need permission because we have a suspect. We believe they're involved in a crime, and we feel they're making contact with the other person, and so they'll tap your phones. But in criminal law, the most important thing besides a suspect to remember is that it's a very, very precise, a very specific type of discipline. You can't just go with approximately. 
that is a difference sometimes between a acquittal and a con being convicted. Because if the, pro if the public, if the judge of instruction gives you permission to put a tap on a phone for the, the duration of a week, they're going to put the day and the hour. If you run over that week, you need to come back before that week and say, I need another week. But you just can't say, well, I get a week and I'll leave it run for a month. Because then you're getting this poisonous tree story again. Because now in the meantime, maybe that big confession about where the 20 bodies buried came on that eighth day. And you get permission on the ninth day. Now, the good news is if your lawyer pick it up for the prosecutor, then they're going to be happy because the case won't go through. But if your lawyer pick it up, the prosecutor is going to have a difficult time explaining himself. When we talk about um, a suspect and the act in a criminal act, we have to understand that there is a, there's a connection between the type of different ways a crime can be committed. You have somebody did something themselves. So they are a dad, they are a, 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 made a, a made a play hit is when you add in somebody else to the picture. But something between um, a accomplice and an actual perpetrator could be something very small but very big. For example, me and three fellas decide we're going to rob a bank. We need some money. Things had. And we sit down and we plan it. And who's going to go where? And what car we going to drive? And what time we going to go? You, for the public prosecutor to convict somebody for something in a, a connection with others, they're going to have to not only show that the crime happened, they're going to have to show your role in it. And of course, since you have a right to remain silent, and you can't be forced to use doing a talk against yourself, and you're presumed to be innocent, you should shut your mouth. But if you go in there, and you start singing, well, then that makes it easier. And I'll explain to you why that's not always fun for the co-conspirators, conspirators, because maybe there was a fifth guy, and that fifth guy role was simple. You work in the bank, you know the codes, you leave and last, just don't put on that lamb. Gotcha. And the rest of us, we're going to do all the heavy lifting. We're going to get a car, we're going to get a big bags, because we're going home rich tonight. And all that guy got to do is not put on the code and come in. There is a lot of discussion then, is that guy a co-perpetrator with others? Was his role deep and so tightly interwoven with the others that he should suffer the same punishment? Of course, the Christians among us will be like, yeah, he shouldn't have been there. Whatever they get, he should get. But criminal law is not going to go on that level. They're going to say, no, we need to punish people for their direct involvement and not what the group do. So that guy can get a lesser sentence, maybe up to a third less, because his role was much less. He just had to leave the door open. He didn't know where they were going to go, how much money they was going to take out. He just had to leave the door open, and you know, he was forgetful that day. <laughs> but things can get complicated for people who just make one plan. To stick with that same example, we're just going to go in, take the money, and go out. You know, sometimes they justify it. It's okay. We're just going in. We're taking out a specific amount. It's the bank. They ain't going to miss it. But when we get in there, we say, but we ain't going to no weapons, though, because the fella leaving the door open, so it's good. But somebody get a little crazy. They watch some kind of movie last night and decide, I'm making sure I get our money. Nobody ain't taking that. I reach this far, I ain't going home empty-handed. And without our knowledge, the other, no, let me have to follow myself before the pro, <laughs> the police tend to think this some kind of confession. These other fictitious people one of them decide, I'm going to walk with a gun because just in case they have that big security guard, I ain't going down like that. And we, the rest of them don't know that they walk with a gun. And lo and behold, this guy pull out a gun, he shoot this gentleman, he dies. Now you, who just had planned to go and do the robbery, you can be facing a murder charge or a manslaughter charge, even though that wasn't your intention. And so, you know... <laughs> you're going to find yourself in a situation where you have to explain, no, I just had to leave the door open, and I just was going to drive. Yeah, but did you know they had a gun? I didn't know I have a gun. And that way criminal law is always touchy because nine out of ten times, while they plan the thing together, nobody willing to take the file for the next one. So they'll be like, of course they knew I had a gun. That was the plan all along. It was her idea to kill everybody. <laughs> I No. Now, you have a lawyer sitting down there saying, listen, the file's saying, but he can't say that thing to you. And that's why criminal law is a very dangerous thing. Now, my grandfather, God rest and bless his soul, he used to say, if he wasn't there, they couldn't call your name. But actually, that ain't true in criminal law neither. <laughs> <laughs> There's a very famous case called the Container Deep Stall Arrest, where these fellas in, I think it was Rotterdam, you know Rotterdam is like the biggest haven in the world. 
and they was like stealing containers. When I say a container, I'm talking about a little rubber made thing, you to put your grapes in where you're going to walk. I'm talking about 40 foot, 60 foot containers. And they were stealing these things. And everybody sat down and they, they decided what they're going to do, what everybody role going to be. But the, the guy that was really planning a lot of it, he wasn't even there. He, they would be doing a robbery here and let's say here in a whole other city. And eventually, with all of the rest and somebody talked and something else happened, they realized But he had such a considerable role in how these robberies was taking place and how everything happened. They considered him also to be a co-perpetrator, even though he wasn't physically there, and he suffered the same fate as the others. Now, why criminal ladders be so touchy is, for example, um, you're home, somebody breaking your house, you catch them, you tell them what you're doing here, the man gets upset, you and he get in an argument, he hits you, you hit him back. You know the most popular thing is self-defense. It was self-defense. I, I had to defend myself. The law cannot ask, ask you when we say you shouldn't kill people that you are about to be killed and stand up there and say, well, I can't kill him because they say don't kill people. Yeah, but he won't kill me. So I'm going to try and fight back. I'm going to try and hurt you back. And then somebody dies. A case I had about a year and change ago where this gentleman came by my client's house, stabbed him and he showed up collarbone here. And the man had his family there, his young child, etc. And the man, like, going downstairs, my gun, to come back to finish off. So my client was like, oh, no, you're not. And he chased him. He went downstairs. And there was a whole stabbing going on from the apartment, which is up down by a and Supply, all the way up to, like, the big, almost by Napa. And the guy had the same, my client now run behind him and trying to stab him and stabbing him. And the gentleman fell. And everybody thought he just fell, but he died. He eventually died in Santo Domingo from complications. And the prosecutor charged my client with murder or manslaughter. Now, the old school street justice was like, boy, remember the man house for? You had to expect that something was going to happen. But again, there's proportionality to when something happens. Somebody hit you, you hit him back. I don't think the prosecutor have a big issue with that. But if somebody hits you, you take a bazooka and blow a whole stomach, a hole in their stomach, it's like, but this is not proportionate. And sometimes you do have a claim to self-defense, but if you overreact, to put it lightly, or you go way beyond proportion, you're going to lose that claim to self-defense, and you will be condemned to, for murder or whatever other charges are. I think most people in here know the difference between murder and manslaughter, though. You know, murders, I get up, and I see some people shaking their head. Okay, Miss Lake. <laughs> You murder, I get up and I decide, you know what, I'm tired of this guy. Every day he cheating on me. Every day I walk in two jobs, I'm going to deal with him. <laughs> when he come home, I'm going to deal with him. And I'm not going to say how I hypothetically would deal with him, but let's just say that when I'm dying, because I happen to make sure he don't breathe anymore. <laughs> that would be murder, because I actually sat there and planned this gentleman's demise. But you can end up killing somebody that you don't even know, and not even intentionally. Like, part of why my voice sounds a little raspy is I'm a, a huge anti-LeBron person, so I'm a hater. And watching game one and two was exciting to see them get blown out. But, I know, now half of the room doesn't get vexed with me. <laughs> but imagine in our arguments and our excitement, and yes and no, somebody said, don't sit down, man, sick of you talking stupidness all night with LeBron, he's the king. And, we end up in an argument, and I'll go to blue the guy, take out the thing, and you know, I defend myself, we have a fight, and he could kill me, and they didn't know me, didn't leave his house intending to kill nobody, but if he does take my life, in that moment, he's guilty of manslaughter, because it wasn't premeditated, it kind of just happened. But, you know, you still could be guilty of murder, and that's why, I mean, the law is so touchy. You still could be guilty of murder, even though you didn't know the person, even though you didn't premeditate to kill them, because maybe the way in which you and this person up in a fight and what you did, you purposely let yourself open to the chance that this person could die. So we're having a fight and you've boxed me and I fall on funny, that you can't really foresee that. But we're having a fight, you take out a knife and you run to my neck and you stab me. That could be murder, even though you didn't plan it, because you know if you cut somebody in the neck, that they're not gonna make it. And that reaches, then we reached a part of criminal law now that the, the people has loved to argue and hate and debate about. But there are, besides um, you know, self-defense and going too far, you have other situations. There was a famous uh, um, case, I think it was in the 40s in, in Holland, where this person was an optician and they had a permit. They had to close their office at a specific time. It's based on a, in a little ordinance somewhere. And 
this man come in, bumbling, half blind, he glass break. You could see he had like some, you know, tata type thickness glasses. And the man was like, I really need your help because if I have to drive home like this, I'm not going to make it. You know, you're going to put people at risk. So the guy said, don't worry about that, man. Come, let's fix you up. And he stayed there with the guy beyond closing time, and he fixed his glasses. And then the next thing the guy knew, the optician was charged with breaking the law and charged with, you know, not, not observing the ordinance times. And he said, listen, I know that there's a law that had to close, but I had a, um, a societal obligation that outweighed that lower law. And then based on that, I don't feel I'm guilty. And that actually worked. They say, yes, it's not normal for you to break the law, but to leave the guy drive, go home half blind, and potentially hurt himself and others, we will let that outweigh what you actually did. And with these stuff rights lighting scrum that they call them, but there's reasons to exclude criminal prosecution, they fall generally in one or two categories. It's either the deed that is going to be excused from prosecution, so this gentleman who stayed open beyond a certain time, or it can be the person who did it, which is in an extreme for version, for example, of self-defense. They went too far, but still it was accepted because at that moment, you always hear it on TV, it was like I was outside of my body and I couldn't see what I was doing. And if the judge believes that, and based on facts and evidence, not just based on what you say, that can work to your advantage and you could be um, excused from criminal prosecution. So if you are arrested, um, how held, long, long can you be held for? I discussed that already, sometimes over um, 100 days because it's three days and then eight days, and then eight days, and then eight days, and then 60 days, and then a maximum of 30 days. And then you have to go to court, whether the prosecutor is finished with his case or not, because the idea is, again, I need to have an end to this story. I need to know what are these things that they're accusing me of. And based on that, the prosecutor can go to court and say, we're not finished, we need some more time. And then, of course, the defense can ask to have the person released pending the outcome of the hearing, uh, the trial that still has to go to court. But what happens, you might ask yourself, because we've had examples where prominent members of our society have been accused of breaking the law, they've been, charged, they've been labeled suspects, and five, six, seven years pass, and they're not going to court. We, uh, without calling names, I think most people know who I'm talking about. And at a certain point, the question is, but do I just sit here and wait until eternity, until you come and decide to charge me? Because, you know, being a suspect nowadays has a lot of consequences. People failing screening left, right, and center, and half of them ain't even get arrested for anything. But you as a, a, a person who can say, listen, you have me as a suspect, it's been going on for a while, you can, come, you can go to court and ask the judge to order the prosecutor to make up your mind. Either you're gonna charge me with something, we're gonna set a date, and we're gonna go to court and see if I'm innocent or not, or you're gonna drop this case and let me move on with my life. Because, you know, the banks nowadays, they have such powers, you could end up losing all your bank accounts, you, like I say, fail screenings, etc. And, and that shouldn't be allowed if the idea is you have a right to a fair trial and a speedy trial. It shouldn't be going on forever and ever. Amen. Now, if you're at the hearing, who all is going to be there? One of the things people don't understand is I'm speaking to you in English now, and sometimes a judge will try his best or her best to speak in English, but the proceedings are done in theory in Dutch because it's a Dutch country. There are Dutch laws, so the Dutch will be the language of the discourse. And generally speaking, it will be you sitting here, your lawyer sitting next to you, a court translator next to you, because they have to be able to speak English, Dutch, Spanish. We have examples with people speaking Chinese and Indian. You're going to find somebody who got to be able to explain to this person what you're being accused of and what the procedures are. And then opposite you, you're going to have the court clerk sitting that's going to be taking the notes and keeping a nice order of events. You're going to have the judge. And then a bit over, you're going to have the public prosecutor who's going to say what needs to happen. Now, you can be acquitted, you can be convicted, and then, of course, either side who's not happy with that decision can go and appeal. We know. Everybody, I think most people know about a double jeopardy. So if you are acquitted and all the um, legal remedies open for challenging that acquittal has been exhausted, they can't arrest you tomorrow for the same thing where you were just acquitted for. In appeal process now, let's say you are convicted and you don't agree with it, you can go on appeal. You generally have 14 days to do that. And in appeal, you're going to have three judges instead of one. And those three judges, they're gonna, it's going to be a completely new hearing. It's all the facts, all the relevant stuff is going to be discussed again. 
in detail where they're going to have their own questions. So it's not like the appeal judges are somehow bound by the first judge. It's like the whole thing happening again, but instead of two eyes, you're going to have six eyes. And when it's all said and done now, if you manage to get acquitted and you were initially convicted and you spent a year and change in jail, you, you have options to take the government to court and collect some kind of compensation, but then of course there's technicalities to that. In a criminal process, we, like I said, we usually have the, the victims on one side, you have the, the suspects on the other side, and the, the banadil de parte is also a term you're gonna come across in criminal law, and that's basically the person that's the injured party. So this individual who's accused of having committed a crime, it was committed against a person sometimes, not just burning down a house, it might be an individual. And that person may have sustained damages, financial or otherwise, and they can try and claim it. I believe the maximum is 50,000 guilders. Anything above that, you're gonna have to go to the civil judge to get that resolved. I know I'm getting some looks here from our respected Mr. Richardson, so I'm gonna try and cut it down. But I, want, I promised that we would speak about a hot topic in the media, and that's the AFPAC team or the asset recovery team, sounds so James Bondish. <laughs> but if we discuss, as we, uh, we all know by now, you can't come after somebody unless they are a? All right, see, we, we're doing better already. And it has to be written somewhere. Now, I called the chief prosecutor to a man to ask him, I said, listen, I'm gonna go speak to a group of highly eager and intelligent people, and I'm, I'm gonna talk about this AFPAC team, but to be honest with you, I don't really understand what the private prosecutor wanna do with this AFPAC team anyhow, so maybe you can explain to me what it is the idea of the AFPAC team is supposed to be, because if we need to operate with the principle of a suspect, and you're saying, or at least what was being discussed in Parliament, all over the media, they're coming for your house, they're gonna take your house, your triple out house. I said, you can't go take people's house, and there's, they're not a suspect, you haven't had a crime, you haven't had, what, what's going on? He's like, of course we're not coming to take people's houses and throw the grandmother on the road. That's something that was misunderstood. Our Minister of Justice said he will not stand for no witch hunt, well, what exactly is the point? Well, you, there are other disciplines in our community that deal with different areas of not only the criminal law, but for example, the tax office. You have obligation to file your taxes and your income. So if you have a little apartment that have five units and you collecting money on that every month, every year, and you're paying taxes on it, and one day the tax man jump up and say, um, you know how the tax office will get assessments. They'll be very creative in the amount that they believe you entitled to have to pay. And they say, we think you owe $150,000. Now you got a problem because you didn't file the taxes, you didn't say you had the income, and if you notice, more and more institutions are becoming more and more stringent when you're filling in farms. If you're filling in your taxes now, for us, those of us that have been doing it, you'll notice they'll ask you, do you rent? And who's your landlord? And how much money are you paying? Because they know the landlord ain't gonna tell you, so they're trying to get it via the tenant. And now you have a, a, a problem. But how does that go now in criminal law? What the prosecutor office is saying is they want to do a collaboration between the different institutions within our community, the tax office, um, the receiver's office, and, and we also have something instituted a while ago called the Landsverordning Melding Ongebruikelijke Transacties, or the MOT, I think you hear about that in the media for over a couple of days, but nobody knows what I mean. And it basically means the banks, insurances, Western Union, they are obligated by law to make a notice and file a notice to the police or sometimes a, a team established by the Minister of Justice in collaboration with the Minister of Finance that you have to make a mention that somebody came here and they had a very unusual transaction. Here we go now with these nice vague words. What's an unusual transaction? The law states it has, it's generally 20,000 guilders and above. So. I go in Nagico, I say I'm feeling pretty hot and heavy today, I feel I look good. I'm gonna sign a, a life insurance. And I want a life insurance for $5.6 million. And they tell me, okay miss, your premium is 250,000 guilders. I say, okay, no problem. I go in my bag, and I pull out $250,000. <laughs> now I paid my premium, what's the big deal? I mean, yeah, but it's not usual to somebody walking out with that kind of money. But you have other examples where it's 5,000 guilders, that's not so crazy. And, and because people know maybe that the amount is $10,000, you know, they deposit $9,999 15 times. That gonna pop up as an unusual transaction too because hello, I mean, you just was a cent shot every single time you had to make a deposit. 
So on that level, they're still going to start looking at you. And what the prosecutor office, what I understand, but he have to speak for himself. What I understand they intend to do is if they can't, I'm going to put it in my term. I'm a defense attorney, so we tend to usually be on opposite side and sometimes semi-enemies. But what the, I think what they're going to do is that if they can't get you over here, then get over there. And basically what it means is they are saying that um, they have noticed that a suspect and then eventual convicted person going to jail for a couple months, maybe a year, don't really hurt them until you touch their money. Because if you got $20 million put on and you convict me for whatever, pick a crime, and I get six months, I ain't going to laugh too loud because they might figure out that I have a plan when I come out. But I'll be like, man. <laughs> <laughs> And when I'm released, I'll just be out. Oh, you know, you ain't gonna find me no more. And so what they're trying to do is make sure they hold it. So what happened is in um in the end of January 2017 in Rotterdam, they had like a huge um, lien they put on this company in Rotterdam that deals with like let's say investments and stuff like that. Those companies tend to have a lot of issues with money laundering. And the, the, the public prosecutor put a lien for 70 million euros on the different accounts that this company had. And that money is just held there. Now, I got to really go quickly because everybody stand to stand up. The, the, the fellas from DCOM, they're making me nervous. But what it is, is in a, in, you, in a criminal investigation, the public prosecutor can also open a criminal financial investigation where they're going now into these assets or money that you would have obtained, they suspect illegally. Without calling a name, I think everybody's going to think about a very important, uh, well, very famous uh, local gentleman that had some signs out there with free, mm, mm, free, mm, mm, okay? Two, two, two syllables, mm, mm. okay. What happened to that gentleman, okay? So you got a, a, cl a clue there as a man, is they decided that this gentleman involved with, you know, human smuggling, and money laundering, and, all kind of other stuff, and what they end up doing is, even though the court, the, the case is, has not gone to court, nobody has been convicted yet, they put out liens on a lot of the assets, including cars, etc., and they sold the cars. Yeah, that, that's the reaction. Whoa. Yeah, and the question is, but how can they sell a car? There was no criminal case, there was no hearing, nobody was being convicted. That's why you don't mess with government, because, well, no, you can mess with them if you have a lawyer. What happened is, in the, in, the, in the cadre, in the whole idea of a criminal um, financial investigation, the public prosecutor can ask the judge of instruction, listen, we believe that this person has obtained money or assets illegally, and we, we want to ask you to put a lien on attachment on these goods or a bank account, because we're concerned that if we don't do it, by the time the case finishes, the money and the stuff is gone. It's a boat. You just jump in the ocean and you, you sail off. So... We want to put a lien on it, and also, at a certain point, you go to the same rector commissar as the judge of instruction and say, but we also need to sell it because we want to avoid a right of amendering. We want to avoid that the, the, the value of this boat or this house or this car is going to go down. And we know cases can go on a year sometimes and postponement and a witness and... And while it's going on, the, the value of this house is both going down. By the time it's done and they, they manage to convict the individual, now instead of $3 million for the boat, you only get 150000 So they say, we want to sell it, make sure we, we maintain the value, and then we're going to put our money on a separate account. It's not going into no individual pockets. Let's hope not. But that is a risk that the prosecutor's office is taking because if that person manages to be acquitted, you sold this man boat, or house, or whatever, and now I, I, I was acquitted, but I can't get back my boat because somebody bought it legally somewhere. And that's where the government ends up in a problem because now that person is going to be able to get their lawyer to start a case against the government and sue them for damages. And, and that's a whole other topic. People think we can't sue them, man. We can. It just needs to be very specific. You're going to ask the government to compensate you for your damages, and your damages is not going to be what they sold it for. The damages is going to be what it was worth when they put it on the attachment. So if it is, and we know as a matter of almost everyday experience, things sold on auction tend to go for a lot lower price, especially if they find out it was this king pin on, and it, he had, what, he killed some people? I don't want he bought, no, I'm sorry. Okay, I'll buy it, but I ain't paying a million. I'll pay 150000 in an ocean, you're looking back. But so now this thing... <laughs> <laughs> 
Because <laughs> you on the ocean with your $150,000 boat feeling good, but this person's like, I want my million dollars because that's what it was worth. And that is what has people very concerned about the AFPAC team because now that you've done your investigation and it's kind of walking in front of the facts if you want to do it, literal translation from Dutch, it's a risk. But to be, to be clear, the prosecutor's office is not crazy. They're not just going to go out there and start selling things if they're not pretty sure in their opinion that there's enough there. Another thing I want to talk briefly before I really have to round off is this another... I wouldn't say a local, but they are very, they had bigger and more signs than people outside the courthouse than the person I just talked about. <laughs> you know? Yeah, three syllables. <laughs> yeah? And um, <laughs> we read in the media, yeah, but this person, they could post a $3 million bail and then they could be released. And everybody said, but we don't have bail in St. Martin. We don't, technically, we don't. But there is a possibility where you are asking the judge of instruction or court in that instance to release you pending the, the case being called because it's going on with postponement, postponement, and the man I think has been sitting over a year in jail. So you're like, listen, I want to be released. When the case call, I'll come back, I promise. And they're like, mm, now I know if you're gonna come back because you may actually have a boat to get away. You don't have no ties to the community, blah, blah. They can say, but you know what, we can release you, but under the condition that you, you put up a certain guarantee and that guarantee for a person of that magnitude would be money of three million dollars if you don't come back when the case called that three million dollars gone so that's that's a pretty big incentive for you to come back but i was just speaking to the attorney apparently that's being met up to today i think they have to continue with it and uh, they're meeting resistance from the prosecutor's office but that is a situation where you don't call it bail, it's basically an uh, insurance to make sure that a person comes back. But you have other types of insurances where if it's a stalking case, they say don't go around the person, you know, other things. I wanna close it off here. I wanna thank you guys um, for the attention. Um, I wanna thank DCOM for inviting me to the University of Samantha for hosting this event. It was my pleasure speaking to everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, attorney at law, Selena Barry. You are watching the Law Matters to You lecture series, an introduction to criminal law, featuring attorney at law, Zelena Barry. Stay tuned. The question and answer segment of the lecture is coming up next. Family law, criminal law, labor law, corporate law, immigration law, electoral law, tax law, environmental law, inheritance law. The law matters to you. A joint venture between the Department of Communication and the University of St. Martin. The lecture series, The Law Matters to You, is aimed at informing and providing the general public of St. Martin about the different laws. We invite you to visit the official government website at www.stmartingov.org for details on upcoming lectures. The law matters to you, bringing the law closer to the people. You are watching the Law Matters to You lecture series, an introduction to criminal law, featuring attorney at law, Zelena Barry. I think the question was about extradition. Is that what you said? How often it happens? I mean, yes. In our system, like, uh, do we fight it or are we helpless towards it? Or? Okay. Well, we're never helpless. The law tries to always create a possibility. And the second question was about polygraphs, if our system has adopted that in the meantime. Um, extradition, you can fight it. Um, I'll tell you the honest to God off the record truth. If it's America want you, <laughs> you're gonna have a tough time fighting it. You you have the right to fight it. There are rules in place, but as a small island, I think sometimes we're very afraid of repercussions from on a big giant like America. But there are reasons to fight it. I can give you a brief example of a case I dealt in the beginning, and then the person went to another attorney, where no no fault of my own, <laughs> where this gentleman <laughs> was being accused on the French side of having committed a crime, but he working over here forever, and they picked him up and said, okay, we want to extradite you over to the French side. People are afraid to get extradited to the French side because they keep saying the, the, the punishment is harsher. No, the punishment is almost the same, because we actually got our laws from the code penal friends, but, but they just have more space to put you, so then you will sit the entire time. 
But what ended up happening with that gentleman is that it was something from eight years ago, they're saying that he did at the time. And he was fighting it, and then he went to another attorney, so I followed it further on the media. But eventually, he was pending the, the, the extradition. He was sent over there. He was here, being detained for like a year. And then eventually, they realized, no, the, 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 the rules weren't there. The, the, the time is too long. And he was released. And I think now he's fighting to see if he can get compensation for sitting for such a long time for something that technically should have never come so far. So yes, we do have extraditions on St. Martin. We've seen a couple of examples in the media in the last couple of years where people are trying to get this one particular individual was um, being requested first via, I think, Curacao, then the you know, States, and then Holland, and then Curacao. And they managed to keep avoiding it. I think in the last one there, um, they, they ran out of the nine lives and they were eventually extradited. And as for the polygraph, to my knowledge, we don't have that. What we have here is a system of sometimes gang fellows getting in groups and deciding they're going to do something because they're big bad men, and sometimes women. And then one get arrested and they turn a parrot. Da, 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 da. And that is sometimes a polygraph because a lot of times it's... <laughs> Somebody confess and call everybody. People who they didn't even look at their name get called. So no, we don't have polygraph, but we the 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 uh, to be serious though, <laughs> we do have where the database. See how upset the cops they gone. <laughs> okay, okay. We do have though that for a while now they've been gathering DNA. When you you really gonna have a question for you, Officer Felix? Okay. Where they've been gathering DNA and they're keeping it in a database because for a very long time, you know, the, the, the kind of upsporting or criminal investigation was, well, who we know to do these type of things? Tommy? Well, go, go pick up Tommy, see if he can come tell us something. But a lot of times things were not being, <laughs> you know, that's how we used to go in Zynga. But what ended up happening now, and that happened recently to a client of mine, it was in a an island water world robbery where he was the only one in first instance to get acquitted. He was my client. And then, I'm not saying there's a connection. I'm not saying there's a connection. I'm just saying. But he was acquitted. And because when they did the DNA test, they couldn't, you know, conclusively determine that the DNA found was his. But his bad luck, because he, he was um, in the system now, and they do the test. So what happened? They run the DNA test. They see what match it is. They put it in the bank. They put it in the bank. So they're going to have these little matches. But even though they couldn't link him to that crime, the DNA found linked him to an open crime that they couldn't solve. And so he was arrested now for that open case that back in the day that would have stayed open forever. But now you can kind of link the person to other ongoing investigations that they never found anybody. So we're not to polygraph. And to be honest with you, Mr. Mock, um, I'm not a big fan of the polygraph. It's not a very reliable thing. I don't know if you ever see a very good, very old movie, The Usual Suspects. I suspect, I suggest you go and look at that movie. Polygraphs can be fooled. I mean, some of the people, they're so nervous, they would, they would never work. But you can condition yourself to trick it. And I, I do prefer our system where we're going on more really hard to refute DNA evidence versus a, a test like polygraph. So thank you for your question. You did make an, a comparison of the American law and the Dutch law. Yeah. And what about now the French law? I'm coming now to my question. I have three questions. Oh, good, great. And um, last week there were a cooperation between the French side and the Dutch side, officers or, mm -hmm. or law, or, or you know. Mm -hmm. And they picked up someone of last week as well. It was in the news about the driver's license, mm -hmm. false driver's license. And I think I read, they said the Shandam came to the Dutch side and picked up the person and took them to the French side. How does that work? A good question. Um, the, there is a cooperation, a very good cooperation between the Dutch side and the French side. We know about things like the Treaty of Concordia and other things. But basically what happens if a, law is a crime is committed on the Dutch side of St. Martin, that gives a public prosecutor authority to act. But they do not have, in theory, in beginning, the right to operate or conduct investigations outside the boundaries of St. Martin, which as small as St. Martin is, French Quarter is France. And so what you do then is you ask for international help 
from the French side to conduct the investigation, international rechtshulpverzoek. And in that, you're going to specify, we would like this person's help. We, 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 we need your help because. I think another good example was the other time, I, I think it was a shooting, and they shot after the police. And they got on a scooter and they keep going to the front side. And at a certain point, they managed to apprehend them, but the police went over there on the front side. So it's basically a cooperation between the two sides. It's understood that you do need to verify that information in writing because you know you can't just walk into France, pick up somebody, and come over. Just like France can't come over to Holland and pick up a person and go over. But it is a cooperation that the two sides have when they're working. Thank you for that question. Yeah, but, um, a continuation on that one. No problem. But what about now? We all know that once you're picked up and you're put in prison on the front side, sometimes they do forget about you. Mm. And you know, it takes a long time before you're tried. Mm -hmm. What about now if, the, for instance, I have a son that has been picked up mm -hmm. and he's arrested on the front side. How would I have someone to represent me, help me to get that case handle or, or go through rather than staying for so many years good question good question i'm gonna stop kicking this thing good question one um if you're arrested on a dutch side you have a right to an attorney it sounds like the show in the states if you can't afford one won't be appointed you the, the whole story but the same thing counts on the front side they have attorneys over there and like i tell you sometimes because of our issues at the prison, people are released before they court date, pending the court date, you have to come back, etc. give up your passport to make sure you come back. But you know, on the French side, they could ship them off to Guadeloupe or Martinique or wherever, and they can then sit and await their trial. But they will have an attorney on the French side or wherever they are, is, but if you need help, you'll have to contact the French authorities over there, find out maybe which lawyer was on call, and if you're not happy or you don't want that on call lawyer, which I have to clarify something about just now, but you can also go and per, uh, pay your own lawyer to represent you. So it's not that they get forgotten about. That is a misconception. There is a criminal proceeding that's happening. It just, of course, is never going to be fast enough for the, the parents or the person themselves. But the, in that procedure, there are safeguards to make sure that a person can be released pending the trial, etc. But that is something that a Dutch side will not be able to influence a French side and say, well, listen, that is Ruthie's son. You need to leave him go because he has to come work tomorrow. No, you're going to have to get your lawyer on the French side, the, your, your, your hypothetical son's uh, lawyer on the French side, to inquire about the possibilities to speed up the trial or have him released. You say I had three questions. One more? No, two. Two? That yeah. was just a continuation. Oh my God! Okay. Um, many years ago, the deceased. Many years ago, the deceased Mr. Kramer said that there is a case about a uh, 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 article or something like that in in the law about slandering people. You know, yes. talking bad about people. That's correct. And there is a certain amount that you can pay for that. The person that does that and it goes into some kind of fun. Yep. Um, I have not heard anything about that since because I heard so many people are just slandering people, yep. you know, name, and then it just goes, you know, just like that in the, in, in the air. Yeah. Can you elaborate on that, please? I definitely will try to. That will bring my book on. We have some very good questions. Luckily for us, we don't have to know all of the single crimes in our head. But what you're talking about is slander, uh, smat, or they call it in Dutch S M A A D, or luster, where you basically, you know, telling a lie about somebody. You have options in the criminal and civil. Uh, arena and yes you can be arrested for that and when do we say about crime and punishment and say Martin a lot of times we talk about jail you go jail for this amount of time but some crimes have a, a fine attached to it a minimum fine in our system can be five guilders but it could be a maximum of one million guilders it depends on what the crime is that you've been accused of and what the maximum has been determined to be payable if you have that as a punishment, but then there's a discretion of the judge to decide based on the circumstances how much would be. So he couldn't just say, well, I think this is a million dollar offense. It would have to be attached to that specific crime. And it would depend on how the, 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 the slander happens. I mean, sometimes people feel slandered for the simplest of things. Um, um, you're walking down the road and somebody's, man, you go sit your fat self down the road. Oh my God, they're slandering my name. I have to go to court now. I have to file a complaint. The police officer said that was nice, but I don't know if you could call that slander. But if you say, yeah, I know that you're taking money under the table and that's how your children getting to go to the CIA and how the, the now you're, you're getting a little more personal. And when we start going in this new world we live in on social media, 
We go on Facebook, we go on Twitter and all these other things, and we ain't just keeping it hypothetical or calling your name or telling you where you live. You're going very deep into this person's right to privacy where we talk, everybody have, and based on that, you can be convicted for it. It's still a, a valid and pending law within our community. It's just my experience has been and my advice has been to clients of mine who complain about being uh, their name being slandered. Nine times out of ten people who are doing that looking for attention. And the minute you jump up and run court and I gonna start a case, you opening a can of worms too because it's not necessarily what they're saying about you, it's true. But now a judge has to go into this story, whether it's in a civil arena or in a criminal arena to say, but did you take the money under the table? Because if it's true, it's not really slander. And then it's like, I didn't take the money, but we saw you that day with a briefcase, and now you have made some one person, some insignificant person blimp a whole story that will get you know, media coverage. And I, I generally advise them if it's not something too you know, crazy that you're involving children, for example, or sexual things, I'd be like, just ignore it, and it tends to go away. I love your presentation this evening. Thank you. Very interesting. Thank you. But I noticed you did not touch on the crime amount youth. Okay. Uh, is that the specific reason, or it was just... No, topic? there's no specific because reason. I just reason try to keep it broad, but if you want me to touch on a particular uh, I area, would, I would be glad would to do so. I would love for you to touch on at least the area with the procedures with the youth, because uh, a lot of parents and a yep. lot of kids don't understand the danger when certain crimes are committed. And it's a little bit complicated for parents to follow at times. The... The suspect, we, we discussed that before, it is not only adults, so people over 18. You can, I mean, the time in the police uh, force is in extreme overdrive is Carnival. I happen to have been on call last Carnival, and I think there was like 20 something people arrested in the space. So I just was like, uh, you know, revolving door, because in the jump ups, people get a little crazy, they drink, they get alcohol, and then they're arrested. Now, normally as an adult, if you get arrested, they're going to read you your rights, you have a right to remain silent, you have a right to a lawyer, etc. And then from there, you're going to sign a form that you waive your rights to speak to a lawyer before you give your first statement, or that you're going to give that statement, but they make you sign that paper now because of some jurisprudence that took place where people didn't speak to a lawyer, confess the first time, and then say, but I didn't know I had a right to a lawyer. So now they're making them sign a paper. Once you are a minor, the whole situation changes because we know... The, the logic is, as a, as a person under 18, you technically are not an adult. You don't have the right to make certain decisions. You don't know half of what you're saying. They sometimes do. But the law wants to protect the youth. And so in that regard, if you're under 18 and you get arrested, the parents have to come in. The police is going to be obligated to contact the parents. The parents are going to have a right to be in the room during the interrogation and have things heard, what's being said, et cetera, et cetera. Sometimes we go by the judge of instruction. They have to go there, too, because the idea is you are a minor, and you want to make sure that the children understand what's going on. Now, I've seen sometimes the parents show up there, and the callots they're giving the children, sometimes the police have to almost arrest the parents. But... The logic is, and it's good that Officer Felix asked that because, Mr. Richards, because you have to, um, sometimes the children feel they're adults and the parents are like, well, I ain't coming in. But the parent not coming in can actually um, obstruct a lot of the, the procedures because the police do need to verify who these people are and, and what the involvement is and how they're going to be involved in the, the, the interrogation of the minor. And then you have the court of guardianship. Also, in our the director in, in attendance this evening, they too get called. You have the SJEB Stichting, you see Richting, both of the Eilanden, and they deal with the youth and all the like social worker aspect, where they're gonna end up having to give a report on what their findings are. You know what happened? Did they understand what's going on? Did they understand the severity of it? Um, uh, you, you have that they're gonna have to give an advice. What do you think should happen? Because what we have is the, pol the police station um, detention center, an actual prison in Point Blanche, whether it's under management critique or not. But we have the Point Blanche prison, but we also have a specific little mini prison for the youth. It's called the uh, MLC, Miss Lally Center. And down there is where they're going to keep all the children that are underage. My personal issue with the Miss Lally Center, sometimes you have a combination of people awaiting a trial because they're underage, being lumped in the same area with other children that have behavioral problems. So they're not actually suspects in a criminal case, but they are being taken out of the home because the parents can't handle them or they beyond what the parents can do. 
and then they gave them a chance to go down there and collude, and that's not a good idea. But there is a separate uh, whole procedure for minors. They do sit in a different uh, facility than the adults, and it is something I urge all the parents to help your kids to understand that you know criminal law is a, is a serious thing because you can be, let's say, a 16, you can be charged as an adult depending on what crime you committed if they believe that when you committed the act, you were you know, operating as you would say, an adult should understand. And you have other children, maybe they, they, they're 17, but they have maybe the maturity and the, the, the thinking processes of a six-year-old. But you can be underage and still be charged as an adult, and that can have heavier penalties for you than a typical teenager. Enough for now. Thank you, officer. Next question, please. Good evening. Good evening. I oh, saw the law matters to you, and I'm thinking, yeah, this is people that has come up for the Mensa. And I would really like to know if you can just give me a brief summary on what the law, you know, like, come up for the, the victims. I didn't hear anything about the victims. I did touch on it briefly, but yeah, maybe okay. not elaborate enough. Um, if it is a criminal setting, because this is what we're focusing on this evening, and, for example... We had a case very recently here in the courthouse with the, the Dutch gentleman that was riding his bicycle and got struck by a car and died. And the family, they, they entered themselves, because the person that is a victim, they can enter into the criminal proceedings by filing a complaint by the police officer, the prosecutor's office saying, I want to involve myself in this case as an injured party. You say, come up for the Mensa, they call those people Bernard de la Pate. And as an injured party, you then submit what your damages are. And, you know, this is not America. We want to make it very clear. We don't sue here for millions for emotional and, and, and all kind of immaterial damages. They really want to focus on actual tangible damages. So burying somebody, how much was the funeral? Can you provide us with a receipt from the funeral home, et cetera? And that person would then be able to file a complaint. The prosecutor is going to take that claim for that amount of money with the case that is against the suspect that is charged with this, in this case, um, doe door skirt because of a traffic accident. And that person, I think, got six months in jail. But, and that's important to explain to just now, but the Bernadette Le Pate plays an important role. One of the things, though, is while it is intended for them to get a cheaper, faster way to get a judgment, because we know civil cases can take a very long time, they're very expensive, you gotta pay a lawyer, you got all these procedures. In a criminal proceeding, it's that you're gonna provide your, your evidence, you're gonna provide your receipts, the prosecutor is gonna take that with the case against the person, they're gonna ask the court to condemn them for whatever the charges are and whatever the demands are, that's gonna be worked out between the court, the lawyer, and um, the prosecutor office. But eventually a sentence is gonna be given and the prosecutor can ask as an additional sentence that they be obligated to pay this amount of money that the person could have substantiated. What happens when the data can't pay? Well, that is, that is where you go into civil law now because Look, I mean, the worst you could do is somebody put him in jail. Uh, and if I'm in jail already and I can't pay 25,000 guilders, then I'm just in jail. But the idea is, unless you're not going to die tomorrow, you're going to get a job at some point, you're going to have a house, you're going to have some asset that I can then attach via this same decision or civil procedure, and then I can have that sold off. Because it happens often. I had a gentleman, he was having some issues, and he was of the opinion that he stopped the bus, gave the bus driver $20, and when he reached in Phillipsburg, the bus driver didn't give him any change. And he decided he gonna get that bus driver back because when he see the bus driver the next day, he started telling him, I want more change, I want more money. And the bus driver was like, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, I want more money. He take up a rocky mash up the windshield. Turn out it wasn't that bus driver. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there you have now this man thinking, who is this crazy person? I never saw you before. I definitely didn't take no money from you. But I want my money, I want my money. And you're going to give me, and he took it and mashed it up. The man had a damage of over $1,000 for a windshield. And he submitted it. But the gentleman lives on the street. The man don't have no money. And then you end up in one of those unfortunate circumstances where you have a nice piece of paper, but it's not going to be translated into actual cash at this moment. You know, so there is a way for you to get a document, but sometimes you don't actually physically get the cash in your hand. That's just, it happens in civil law too. Okay, one thing. Is there some kind of compensation within St. Martin law that you can help the victim until the daughter is able to pay? When you say help, could you clarify? You know, like in Holland, how we got the uh, scatophones? Yeah. 
Is there some kind of compensation within the law here in St. Martin? I'm sure there's some kind of funds. But you know, St. Martin have an issue with money. <laughs> and... <laughs> huh? <laughs> there we don't, we don't, I don't, to my knowledge, we don't have any. It's unfortunate. You just got to hope you have some supportive friends and family to help you through it. Thank you. No problem. Thank, Thank you. you so much for your questions. Is there anybody else who would like to ask any questions at this time? There was one lady, she gave me a paper sitting right behind Ms. Brooks Solomon that's going to get up just now to ask a question. Yeah. She said she don't know if she was feeling well, so she asked me to read the question and answer it if possible, Ms. Brown. No, the weaver. Yeah. You want to come ask the question now? Do you think that the term evidence need modification to include manipulation of science that could have an impact on a case? Thank you. Very loaded question. That I wanted to ask it again, because I almost don't even understand what it is. Um, evidence, let's start at the beginning. You have to break it down systematically. Evidence, it, the, the judge, when he decides if he's going to decide that somebody's innocent or guilty, they're going to use what they call wettig and overtuigend bewijs. You have to have both of them. You can't, wettig, for the audience that don't understand that piece, it has to be legal evidence. We discussed the fruit of the poisonous tree. All of those things would fall out. But, for example, legal evidence would be somebody committed a crime, the person who had the crime committed against them filed a complaint at a police officer at the police station. That is part of the legal evidence. The complaint itself is legal evidence. Then maybe you had a witness who said, I saw Tom or Jane do this. That's evidence. That's a witness statement that can be used. Maybe they did the DNA. Nowadays, they don't do blood and all that. Like before, they just take a swab out of your cheek. They're going to run it up to the National Forensic Institute in Holland. That's going to be tested, and then they're going to come back and say the likelihood in terms of percentage that you were or were not involved. And that is evidence as well. Sometimes it works for you because if they can't link you to it, sometimes it says 99.9998 is that person. Then you really have a little issue coming out from it. But the evidence needs to not only be legal, so a statement, a witness, some DNA, it also has to be convincing. And I had a case last week that was uh, handling appeal. One of the Island Waterwall guys that wasn't my client in the first instance, that was condemned, he got four years. And the parents came and asked me to do the case and appeal. And he was acquitted last week or the week before because they had legal evidence, but it wasn't convincing. And because of that, he had to be acquitted. And what they found was, yeah, there was a getaway car. Um, they have some others. Sometimes the police, God bless their soul, they get tunnel vision. And because there's the rest of them, and he to be with them, or he was there, or there was a telephone tap, they say he got to be in it too. And so it ended up happening. They say he's part of the group. They say because they find a bag. He was by a particular HM bureau. And I was like, listen, you find a bag, but you find on that list, you can find about 150 people that has go to that urgent bureau. That don't mean nothing. Yeah, there was DNA, and the DNA linking him to it. I said, well, not really. And that's where things get very technical in criminal law, because with DNA, it's a very touchy thing. DNA in and of itself cannot function as a sole uh, evidence to condemn you in a criminal case. It can be what they call a stern bias. It's something that's additional to what already exists in the form of legal evidence. But you can't say, well, I got you in a DNA, you're going to jail. Because I've been standing here and talking at this podium. I have DNA all over this podium. And if tomorrow somebody come in and fight and fall along here, they, they does this, they might find my DNA on it. And it's a broad example because you have to make sure that the DNA was what they call veilig gesteld, make sure they had no contamination, you know, like what happened to the OJ case and so on. But you, you test it and you find this DNA and you find that I'm involved in it, there might be multiple explanations for finding my DNA on this podium that doesn't involve me necessarily being one of the perpetrators of an act. And so they found the DNA. He said, listen, I went out with these guys. It was a birthday party on the beach. I went in to drink that food and drink. I went, they had a, a ski mask there, and they had some other backpack in the food. What are you laughing for? That can't be plausible. <laughs> and they moved the ski mask, so they did touch it, and they moved the ski mask, and they get the food, and they went. And that's how my DNA gets on the ski mask. And what they did was they didn't just test the ski mask, they check around the eyes and the nose and the mouth, because, I mean, you move a ski mask, it can't end up with your eyes and nose on it. That means you had it on. And they couldn't... They couldn't establish that he had it on, and not because he touched it and moved it, mean it was that. And what the judge said was, well, he was on the phone, and he was talking, first instance, when he got condemned for the four years, and he was talking to one of the guys, and he was trying to arrange a gun. 
And I was like, but when I checked the time stamp on it, I said, but that conversation happened after the robbery. So how are we going to ask for a gun to go back in time unless you have a space machine, go commit this crime, and then come back? And when all of those evidence, even though they were legal evidence, there was DNA, there was a telephone tap, it wasn't convincing to prove his guilt. And so he was acquitted and he was released. But you asked, you asked to go back to the main thing. You wanted to know manipulation of science, the D. Evidence. So evidence is always going to be what it is, legal and convincing. If it's not convincing, that's it. And we can't really, the manipulation, we're going a little beyond our, our scope here on Samantha. I think only a couple of years we have a forensic team anyhow. You know, people used to complain, I'm sorry officers, that when there was a robbery, they tell you, take a bag and throw something in it and bring it, and then we're going to test it. And now we have a whole team that goes in much more detail. And to close off this evening, appropriately, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the head of the Department of Communication, Mr. Rodney Richardson. As I'm here to do the vote of thanks, I'd like to thank the Deputy Prime Minister, Minister of Justice, the Honorable Raphael Bosman, for giving us his address this evening. I'd also like to thank the representative of the USM and also the Shell program, Mr. Ian Mason, and on behalf of the Department of Communication, I'd like to thank the staff, members of DCOM, and also those of the University of St. Martin for your continued dedication and hard work in executing this successful lecture series, The Law Matters to You. And tonight will not be a success if we do not have your attendance, the audience here this evening. A round of applause for yourselves. As is customary at this point, we usually give a token of appreciation, so I'd like to call up Ms. Barry. Please come forward. <laughs> to help give this token of appreciation, I'd also like to welcome to the lectern Deputy Prime Minister, the Honorable Mr. Boseman, and also representative of the university, Mr. Ian Mason. Deputy Prime Minister, can you give us the opportunity to read the to token of appreciation? It reads, the law matters to you, presented to Selina Barry, LLM, in recognition of your important contribution as keynote speaker at the Law Matters to You lecture series, June 6, 2017, from Department of Communication and the University of St. Martin. Thank you. I, I, I have to do this. I know it's not on the schedule, but I think this evening was a special evening. I never saw the combination of lecturing on a topic like criminal law. Law is one of the most boring subjects sometimes. <laughs> and um, while getting very valuable information, you know, everyone basically had a good time. Yes. I think it is, it is commendable. And I, at the beginning I said that you're getting free information and, and that is exactly what happened. Give another round of applause.